This is the adventure of the Bible number six. And I'm looking at end times angels. I'm going to start out in the Pauline epistles looking at angels in the church age. First, let's look at Romans 8, 38 through 39. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see that? He said, I'm persuaded neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. You know, all these things, none of these things can separate us from the Lord Jesus Christ, from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. seems that Paul is hinting that there are angels who would love to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Most likely because the devil's angels are wanting to separate you from the love of God. Uh, the hell's angels don't want you have any having anything that they've lost any more than the devil wants you to have something that he's lost. You know, angels excel in strength. They are greater in power and might than we are. But they cannot pull you from the hand of the Almighty. In 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The devil is coming after the bride as an angel of light, pretending to give you all this wisdom of men. Wisdom of the world, corrupt wisdom. He's pretending to give all these big time scholars all this wisdom to correct what God said. He's pretending to give all these big time flashy preachers all this stuff to make you think that they know more than God does, know more than the book does, make you think that, you know, you need to turn from the ways of God to these ways that are higher and greater than the ways of God. Why do you think Bible correctors and watered-down Christian material is, is so popular today? You know, there's, there's stuff that they call evil good and good evil, and it's they got this pious attitude, and it's just watered down. The devil is appearing as an angel of light as a religious being, trying to make you think he's even more right and spiritual than God himself is. So the devil's a, that's just the devil appearing as an angel of light to the bride while they're waiting on the groom to come back. Just like he did with Eve when Adam wasn't around. He's saying, hey, check out all these great scholars who can really give you the word of God. You know, they know Greek and they know Hebrew, they know Latin, and they really know what God said. And if you really want to know what God said, you just, you, you got to learn the Greek and the Hebrew. And until then, you got to listen to these big time guys over here that they've went to college and they know the Greek and the Hebrew and they can tell you what God said and then they just proceed to correct your Bible. But there is the old anointed cherub appearing as an angel of light. And you have fallen angels that Paul warns against that, might give you uh, a false gospel. They might give you bad doctrine. They might give you or take away from you your assurance of salvation. It definitely seems that fallen angels are at work in the church age. It says in Galatians 1, 8 through 9, But though we are an angel from heaven... Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. You see, a fallen angel would hate the gospel because he can't get in on it. So Paul says, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. You know, if an angel from heaven starts preaching a false gospel, he's not going to be an angel from heaven anymore. He's going to be a fallen angel. And, you know, you think about 
these guys that say an angel has spoken to me, you know, Joseph Smith had the angel Moroni or Moroni supposedly come and speak to him. Well, that angel gave him bad doctrine, a bad gospel. And that took place in the church age. Lester Crowley claimed to have some type of spirit being talked to him. All kinds of people. Well, that's just angels giving false gospels. And we don't have much open angel activity today like they did in the Old Testament because we're walking by faith and not by sight. You know, I don't believe that God is having angels come and give us revelation outside of the scriptures. I don't believe that at all. So most likely you got an angel coming to talk to you. That's most likely an unclean spirit or a fallen angel. It's not an angel of God because God's not using the angels like that now. You know, we got a complete Bible. We got all 66 books of the Bible, coincides with the 66 chapters of Isaiah confirming it to you. And in the church age, what you're dealing with is unclean spirits that want to separate you from the love of God, that want to give you a false gospel. So most of the angel work you see today is by fallen angels or hoaxes, mostly. Just people trying to get attention. And you'll notice all this stuff you see, people claiming that they heard from an angel. It never comes to pass. It never happens. And that makes them a false prophet. And if they really were talking to an angel, obviously it makes them a fallen angel. That wasn't an angel of God going around telling them these false prophecies and these false gospels and this bad doctrine every so often i'll see someone telling me an angel told them that the rapture is gonna be on such and such a date and, and they'll say our oh, angel spoke to me but it never happens that's if they really did talk to an angel that was a fallen angel that was not an angel of god and so angels in the church age the good ones you know, they're behind the scenes doing stuff. Now, the bad ones, maybe there are bad ones coming down and giving people a false gospel. But for the most part, there's not open angel activity going on because, as Paul says, we walk by faith, not by sight. You know, if we could see these angels and we could see the cherubims just like they could back there when the, uh, the Lord had cherubims garden, the Garden of Eden, you know, we would not be walking by faith we'd be walking by sight we would know that hey all this stuff is is just out in the open it's not to take much faith but that's angels at the church age well at the close of the church age there's going to be a rapture and we're going to be taken out of here so that's number two what about angels at the rapture we're looking at the angels in end times events what about angels at the rapture well, there will be angel activity at the rapture, but it most likely won't be telling you about it on YouTube videos, you know, a month before it happens. As you know, you just type in right now, uh, angel told me this prophecy, an angel came to me in a dream, an angel did this or that. No, that's not the angel's part in the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of god and the dead in christ shall rise first so there's the rapture and it involves the voice of the archangel well at the rapture you're going to hear god's voice you know sounding like a trumpet saying come up hither according to revelation 4 1 but you're also going to hear the voice of the archangel that's the chief angel that's michael not gabriel it, it calls the archangel michael in the book of Jude. And it's fitting you hear the voice of Michael the archangel because Michael is the angel that stands with Israel and at the rapture, God goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel during the time of their trouble. In Daniel 12, 1, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. 
such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So you see that Michael stands with the children of thy people, Israel. And he's going to be standing up. You're going to hear the voice of the archangel at the rapture. And then after the rapture, God goes back to dealing with Israel. And then you're going to see a lot of angel activity happen again. You know why? Because the Jews operate by sight. They uh, seek signs. 1 Corinthians one twenty two for the Jews require a sign. So you got angels in the church age. You got angels at the rapture. Well, what about angels at the judgment seat of Christ? So there is definitely, as you can see, angel activity at the rapture. What about at the judgment seat of Christ? This judgment is taking place, is going to take place in the third heaven after the rapture while the earth is going through the tribulation, most likely. You, you got people that believe that the judgment seat of Christ actually happens um, later on after the tribulation. But it, I've always thought, you know, it happened during the tribulation. We'll be up in heaven being judged. But is there angel activity there, or do angels play a part in this judgment? I believe angels will be present around the throne, obviously, but also consider how the fallen angels cause havoc today and will cause you to forfeit rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. So in this sense, they do have a part. In Colossians 2.18, it says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. You see, you have some re rewards that are reserved up there in heaven for you, but there are some rewards and crowns that you got to earn. And there are some rewards and crowns that you will lose. Because, for example, here, it says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. So there are some rewards and crowns that you will lose because you're worshiping angels. You say, how am I going to worship angels? Well, there's different ways. And I mean, and this is Paul in a church age epistle, Colossians. And since it's, you know, Colossians, he mentions the, the uh, church of Laodicea several times in the book of Colossians. And Laodicea is the end times church period. In the book of Revelation, you know, Laodicea. And so it's even more uh, relevant for us today because that's the church time period that we're in, Laodicea. And you see, you say, well, how would an angel, you know, how would I worship an angel? Well, think about it. The devil appears as an angel of light, right? And Jesus Christ shows up as the angel of the Lord, right? But Paul also talks about another Jesus. So what you have here is a fake, counterfeit Lord Jesus Christ that a lot of people are worshiping. And it's actually just an unclean spirit or a fallen angel imitating the real thing. That's one way, just one way of many, you could end up worshiping an angel. You're worshiping another Jesus, which would be appearing as a fake angel of the Lord, an angel of light. Also think about this. Now, this is just speculation, but perhaps towards the very closing end of the church age, this is just speculation. You know, with any dispensation, he has you transition into that dispensation. Just like with Matthew, you're transitioning from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the book of Acts, you're going from Jew to Gentile, it's a, it's a transition book, Jew to the church. And you got a lot of wild things happening and a lot of different things happening because of that transition. Well, I, I wonder if there's going to be a transition that we would be here for, for a bit, and perhaps the transition would happen after the rapture. That's more likely. But 
a transition from the church age into the tribulation. And then when you get right up to the end of the church age, I, I always wondered, this is speculation, if the Lord would begin letting the dispensational lines cross a bit, and as he transitions back into dealing with Israel, he allows us a little bit of supernatural stuff to happen, like with the angels. Obviously, with the rapture, you'll have a huge sign to kick off the time where God once again begins dealing with Israel. But perhaps at the very close of the church age, you might begin entertaining angels unawares right before the tribulation as we, you, they, it's a transition in. And then there would be an opportunity for somebody to worship an angel, possibly unknowingly. And that's just speculation, but obviously there's different ways people could worship angels. And obviously those people that's constantly putting out this stuff of an angel spoke to me, this angel came to me, and they're putting what that angel said over the Bible, you know, that's worshiping angels. You're putting that angel before what God himself said. But there's going to be actual saved people that have been that have their rewards taken away because of worshiping an angel at the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to get up there and they're going to have had their reward taken away because of a worshiping of an angel. So angels have a part in the church age, the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ. And now this is going to take up the bulk of our time Angels play a huge part in the tribulation. You see the word angel or angels over 70 times in the book of Revelation. That's a lot. So this is a, you know, uh, you don't hear, I don't know that I've ever heard a study on end times angels like this, but it's, it's very significant. Because look at how many times their name appears. Angel or angels appears in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 5, 2 through 4, it says, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look their own. So nobody up there is going to be worthy to open that book and to loose the seals thereof. Not even the angels are worthy to open the book. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ, our tour guide of the Scriptures, remember. And in all things, he needs the preeminence because he is so much better. Hebrews said he is so much better than the angels. No wonder he can open the book. Not even that strong angel with that loud voice can open the book. And angels play a huge part in the tribulation. Even though God is focused on men, he doesn't forget to give his other creation a part in his plans. And they can't open the book here. They're going to get a lamb, the lamb to open the book. But God uses them all throughout the tribulation time period. For example, Revelation 7, 1. It says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that, sh that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. So you got these four angels. Obviously, they excel in strength and are greater in power and might, and they will hold back the four winds of the earth. You know, think about the strength it would take to do such a thing. Think about Proverbs 30 and verse 4, where it talks about the Lord holding the winds in his fists. But you've got them in the tribulation, and the Lord's using them to bring in all these catastrophes. All this judgment of God on the earth. These angels can't have a weak stomach. These angels can't be like 
King Saul was not killing everybody that God said to kill. You know, they're going to be doing exactly what he said. You know, there's going to be uh, women and children on this earth that me and you would be like, oh, I hate to do that to a, to the innocent. And these angels aren't going to be like that. They're going to be willingly bringing out the judgment of God. They understand the judgment of God. They understand that the reason that he's bringing this judgment on the earth is because nobody's actually innocent. And God is wiser than men. God is wiser than angels. They're these angels that are acting out the judgment of God, they understand that God is wiser than all, and they understand what God's having them do. In Revelation 7, 2 through 3, it says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I sometimes read this and I think about how, you know, I know the angels know the Bible. You know, Peter talks about how they desire to look into the gospel. And I think about what it would be like when this event's going on and those four angels hear that other angel come through and frantically say, hurt not the earth, neither the trees, and so on. And I wonder if they then realize, oh, this is Revelation 7. This is what I'm doing right now. This is Revelation 7. You know, angels perhaps are doing as the Lord tells them and don't know how things are going to end up any more than we do. But when they hear that angel coming and saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the tree, so we've sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads, they got to be realizing, well, this is, this is fulfilling Scripture here. Now, Revelation 8, 2 through 5, look at what else John sees. Now, the book of Revelation, what you've got is John writing down what he saw with his own two eyes. And he said, and I saw these seven angels. You want to know what an angel looks like? You you ask the apostle John. And it's and he's because he's seen them like every other verse. And he says, and I saw the seven angels which stood before God. So these angels, they're at his command. Whatever he says to do, they're doing it. And it says, And to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. He just takes it and casts it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. You know, whoever this angel is really has an arm on him. He just takes it, casts it into the earth. Imagine him throwing that censer with fire coming off of it and the Lord saying, Raphael or whatever his name is, you, you just put another hole in the sea of glass. And then it just goes straight down through the second heaven and into the earth. And you hear thunderings, and you hear lightnings, and you hear an earthquake. And when I was little, my papa would see me getting scared of the thunder and lightning, and he'd say, that's just the angels bowling. And I don't think angels bowl, but maybe it is the Lord having the angels do stuff. And that's, you know, it has something to do with the Lord, that thunder and that lightning. He's the one that's in control of that. Or allowing the devil to do something with it. You know, the uh, the devil was anointed cherub, and we already talked about how, you know, they run and return as a flash of lightning. And 
uh, the Lord said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I think there's something spiritually connected with the thunder and the lightning. But Revelation 8, 6, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. You know, imagine being one of the seven here. Imagine being one of the seven of the, out of all the innumerable company of angels that gets to blow a trumpet. And I often wonder if angels have been getting rewarded with certain honors to do things throughout history. And these seven completed some great mission and earned their spot as those, these seven angels that get to blow the trumpet in the tribulation. And once again, I'm speculating, but you know, that would be, I imagine it would be an honor to be one of the seven angels that blow the seven trumpets in the tribulation time period, or one of these angels that's going to play a huge part in that coming time period. But it says in Revelation 8, 7, the first angel sounded, and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burned up, and the second angel sounded and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed and the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters and the name of the star is called wormwood and the third part of the waters become wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter so you see it's just like the first angel the second angel the third angel over and over again you got angels at work in that future time period where god goes back dealing with israel so you got a lot of angel activity going on and sometimes even here i wondered is this star it's mentioning is that just a regular star or is that also an angel itself? Because remember, in Revelation 1.20, uh, he said the, uh, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And then this star is called Wormwood. Is that a, an angel? You have, if it is, you got another named angel in the Bible, Wormwood. In Revelation 8.12 and 13, it says, And the fourth angel sounded. And the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. You know, this angel flying through the midst of heaven, what if they can hear it? You know, since the veil between the physical and spiritual will seem to be much thinner during that time, what if the people can hear it and they're still not listening? It says in Revelation 9-1, the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Here, star definitely does seem to be referring to an angel. The star seems to be another angel, and he's got a key. Just as Revelation 1.20 refers to angels as stars, well, this angel falls from heaven to the earth, and he's got a key in his hand, a key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a the smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. So this angel comes down, opens the bottomless pit with a key. The Lord had to give him the key. So, you know, you got keys in the Bible. You got a key, keys of hell and death. You've got key to the bottomless pit. And in Revelation 9, 13, and the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men, coming out of there like a bunch of attack dogs or something. 
you know, four angels being loosed out of the of a river to kill the third part of men, that sounds really terrifying for the people in the tribulation. You don't want to be here during this time. You want to make sure you're saved now. That way you can go out in a rapture before this time happens. You know, what's wild is John is seeing all this stuff with his own eyes. And in the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to be killed. And Satan's going to be kicked out of heaven bodily and go down to the earth to enter into the Antichrist. In Revelation 12, 7 through 9, it's talking about this event. And it says, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So you have angelic warfare going on during the tribulation. This can't be referring to Lucifer's original fall when he fell positionally, because he still frequents heaven as he did in the book of Job. But see... Michael and his angels fight against the dragon and his angels. So you got angels fighting during the tribulation. And when, when that uh, man of sin gets a deadly head wound and comes back as the son of perdition, the devil's down here. He's been cast out into the earth and he's going to have full control and full power over the Antichrist. And he's going to set up the Mark of the Beast system. He's going to be asking for all this worship. And he's going to set up that system which automatically damns all those who receive it. So you have angels showing up, spreading the everlasting gospel, warning against taking the mark, and telling what will happen if you do. In Revelation fourteen six, it says, And I saw another angel. That's all John seems to be seeing is angel here, angel over there. Another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So think about this for a moment. Not only will the people on earth have 144,000 male Jewish virgins with sign gifts as witnesses, Moses and Elijah will be there as witnesses, you know, the guy that represents the law and the guy that represents the prophets. And also an angel flying, preaching the everlasting gospel to every person on the planet. You know, that's a very wild thing to imagine. The truth's going to be out there. And that shows God's long suffering, his mercy, his grace, and his kindness. And he's putting out the word all the way up until the very end with all these uh, witnesses out there. The angels, the 144,000, the two witnesses. So you're going to have this angel. Now, if an angel preached the everlasting gospel today, that would be a false gospel because he, he's not saying the death, burial, and resurrection as we refer to as the gospel today. And he's saying, fear God and give glory to him. Well, how do you know that's what he's saying? Well, it's in the next verse. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So why is he saying that? Because the Antichrist is going to set up the mark of the beast system. And he's going to want you to fear him. You, the people that take the mark fear men. They're giving him glory. Just like Herod was killed and eaten of worms because he gave not the glory. He's a picture of the Antichrist. This angel is going to be saying, fear God and give glory to him, not the Antichrist and to his glory, you see. And then he's going to say, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. You know, don't worship the Antichrist over here. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You know, Babylon's fallen. This, this world's going to crumble. Worship the one that made heaven and earth. All this greatness you're seeing is going to crumble. And then you got this third angel that follows them along. 
saying what will happen if you take the mark of the beast. You see how all this goes together here. Worship him that made heaven and earth. Fear God and give glory to him. You know, this world's going to crumble. Babylon has fallen. And then a third angel saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now you got this angel proclaiming, don't take the mark. Saying, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. You see, they have to keep the commandments and the faith of Jesus, both. Because if you take the mark, you're breaking the commandments. Just think about it. You take the mark, you think about the commandment, thou shalt not covet. Uh, why are you taking the mark? Because you have to buy and sell, and you're going to buy and sell even if you have to go against God to do it. Or thou shalt not have any graven image. Those that take the mark, Revelation 13, they worship the Antichrist image. Or thou shalt have no other gods before me. Oh, they're taking the devil, the Antichrist, before God. Or thou shalt not commit adultery. They're committing spiritual adultery. Or thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, they're going to be perpetrating that strong delusion, believing a lie and teaching a lie. See, you, you take the mark, you're breaking the commandments. And it's amazing just how much angels play a part in the tribulation time period. It just goes on and on. Revelation 16, 1 and 2, it says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. I imagine the angels thinking, you know, man, we warned you guys about taking the mark. Now we're pouring this vial on you and giving you this noisome and grievous sore. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. So the angels aren't like many people today, you know, who would say, Why would... Why would God kill so many innocent animals and humans? This angel of the waters is saying, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. You know, the angels from heaven understand the righteous judgment of the tribulation. Revelation six and or Revelation sixteen six, for they have shed the blood of saints and of prophets. The angels know that. The people on the planet at this time are completely against God. They've shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. They're worthy of all this judgment that's coming on them. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Our God is a consuming fire. He gives power to the angel to scorch men with fire. And I've heard nothing hurts worse than being burned. And with all this fire talk in the Bible, you would think people would wise up and get right with the God that is a consuming fire. You're seeing it over and over again. In Revelation 16, 9, And men were scorched with great heat. But what do they do? And blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give Him glory. Their soul hard and stiff-necked that the more he whips them the more that they're gonna revolt against him you know and isaiah says why should you be stricken anymore you will revolt more and more the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint like a kid you can just whip him and whip him and whip him sometimes and he just do even worse in Revelation 16.10, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. 
This angel literally knocks the lights out of the Antichrist kingdom. Uh, the Antichrist kingdom gets full of darkness. And look what he does. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. You know, I imagine sometimes the angels is uh, looking on the earth and thinking, what does the Lord see in these people? And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, once again, I'm going to give you some speculation, but I wonder if the Antichrist would take credit for drying up these waters and claim he's doing a Red Sea crossing miracle or a stopping the Jordan type of miracle. And this, this army that will gather against the armies of heaven must be very confident and think they have the right God. And when they see stuff like this, I wonder if he's, that the Antichrist is going to say that he did that. And it's just going to give his army more boldness to go against this army of heaven coming down. But they've been scammed. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the vine, cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath and every island fled away and the mountains were not found and there fell upon men a great hell out of heaven every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed god because of the plague of the hell for the plague thereof was exceeding great so the lord uses angels to pour out his vials that will bring in catastrophes that would be worse than all the natural disasters you've ever seen put together and there came one of the seven angels, this is Revelation 7, 1. There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee, show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So angels, going back and forth in time, just like John, when he gets the revelation, the angels go back and forth in time. He's taking John all the way to the fall of Mystery Babylon. And John says in Revelation 17, 6 and 7, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The angel asked John, you know, Why are you marveling at this? The angel, of, the angel is very aware how wicked Rome is. And it says in Revelation 18, 1 and 2, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So an angel comes down, lighting up the skies, and gets the privilege of announcing the destruction of Babylon. In Revelation 18, 21, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with the violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. So that's angels in the tribulation. You got angels in the church age, angels at the rapture. Angels at the judgment seat of Christ. Angels in the tribulation. What about angels and the second coming? Well, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8, it says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we know the Lord comes back with ten thousands of his saints. But did you know... He also comes back with his mighty angels. Now some interpret the angels there to be us in our glorified bodies since we replaced the angels that fell. But to me it seems the mighty angels come with us as well at the second coming. Because Matthew 16, 27 it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his fathers, come in the glory of his father 
with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Revelation fourteen fourteen. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having his having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle, and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sit on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. You see, when Jesus Christ comes back, he cometh with clouds, and there's an angel there saying, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. And Revelation fourteen sixteen it says, And he that sit on the cloud thrust in his sickle to the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trod without the city. And blood came out of the winepress, even into the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. This is the second coming, when Jesus Christ comes back on a white horse, stomping people like they're a bunch of grapes, and there's angels with him. That's the second coming, blood up to the horses' bridles. And the angels are thrusting in sickles. Why do you think they draw the grim reaper with a sickle? The real reapers are the angels. In Matthew thirteen thirty nine through 42, it says, The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. They're going to swoop down and gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be welling a gnashing of teeth. Just as in Revelation 19, they cast them into the winepress of the wrath of God. Matthew twenty four twenty nine through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of, of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So at the second coming, the Lord comes with his mighty angels, and they're going to cast the wicked ones into the wine press, and they're going to gather the elect together from one end of heaven to the other, now, this isn't our rapture. Our rapture already took place. We're already coming back down with them right here. And you must remember all those people who got right with the Lord during the tribulation. You know, there's people who get right with the Lord after we already leave during the tribulation time period. And the angels are going to gather together the good ones. They're going to gather together the bad ones. And they're going to throw the bad ones into a furnace of fire. You know, the Lord's coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance. Then Revelation 19, the famous second coming chapter, Revelation 19, 13 through 17. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him up on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he that treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel. Of course you did, John. That's all you're seeing. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. So the angel is up there in the sun, pouring in sweat, I'm sure. No, I'm just kidding. And he's announcing to all those fowls to come down and get together because it's supper time. And they're going to feast on the flesh of those dead bodies. You got this angel up there in the sun at the second coming announcing to those birds that it's supper time. Communicating with the animals. That's angels at the second coming. You know... 
back before man, a lot of those angels fell. God didn't just write off the whole angelic species because of the angels that fell. He's using them all the way throughout his plan. You got angels in the millennium. An angel announces that the kingdom has now been taken over and Jesus Christ is reigning. He's going to announce the millennial kingdom. In Revelation 11, 15 and 16, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God in their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God. That seventh angel sounds, and you're going to hear voices of those angels in heaven announcing the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. Imagine a king and his army coming through, and wiping out your nation's army. And then he is your king. Well, one day heaven's going to open. The Lord's going to come down. And wipe out all the armies of the nations. And he's going to be king of the whole world. And then you have another angel who gets the privilege of locking Satan up right before the millennium. In Revelation 21 through 3 it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should not, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. What an honor to be the angel that gets to come down and bind the devil and put him in the bottomless pit. Some people say it's Michael. I doesn't say, I'm not sure. But what an honor that would be. Well, what about after the millennium? Well, after the millennium, you got the great white throne judgment. And do angels have a part there? I believe so. 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? Well, at the great white throne judgment, it seems the saints are going to judge angels. And you're not even going to be afraid. You know, there's a lot of people that... When they go and they testify against somebody in a courtroom, maybe somebody that's killed a bunch of people, killed somebody they love, they're afraid of that person. You're going to be in a glorified body that's way more powerful than an angel. And you're going to have God Almighty with you. And you're going to judge angels. So how much more things that pertain to this life? Well, what about angels in eternity? In Revelation 21, 9 through 12, it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials for the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. This is in eternity. And John sees twelve gates, and at the gates, twelve angels. So you got angels in eternity. In eternity, you've got everybody coming together. You got the angels, you got the Old Testament saints, the saints under the law, you got the saints during the earthly ministry of Jesus, you got the church age saints, the tribulation saints, the millennial saints, you got saints being born all the time, and you got the angels, all the family of God together. And just the fact that God still uses the angels all throughout history shows me that God's just not done with, God's not just going to look at a, a creation you know people think you know they look at the earth and they see how bad people are and they think well uh, God's probably just done with this whole creation look how bad people are no he's not going to throw a whole creation of a species away just because most of them was bad and he didn't throw the angels away he's using angels all throughout time giving them a part giving them a job and just like he's got the angels a part and a job, he's got a part and a job that he wants you to fulfill.